Hello and welcome, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. OK. Um, are we all set up with the online um, setup? OK, welcome to everyone online as well. Um, my name is Lisa Poggiali. I'm a senior democracy data and technology specialist at USAID. And? I'm Sina Leclerc, and I'm senior program officer within the Democratic and Inclusive Governance uh, Division in the International Development Research Center, Canada. Okay, and we're delighted to welcome you to this session to launch the Donor Principles for Human Rights in the Digital Age. Um, I just want to give out a few housekeeping notes, and then we will officially start the session. Um, so first, I just wanted to issue a huge thanks to the Freedom Online Coalition Support Unit, who are sitting right over there, for making all of this possible, and as well for supporting the drafting and negotiation of the donor principles process over the past six months or so. Um, they've been absolutely fabulous, and so thank you so much. Um, so we have a copy of the donor principles at all of the seats around the table. If you do not have a copy, they're also right by the entrance, so please pick up a physical copy. We also put a sign-up sheet over there, which I think is going to be going around the table. Um, that's so that we can communicate, follow up, since this discussion will be both a launch and also the beginning of uh, the implementation process of the donor principles. So we would love to be able to follow up and include you in those conversations as we start to roll out implementation in the next months and, and the next year. Um, we also have a website, which was up on the screen before, but we'll also um, put that up in a little bit, which is the Freedom Online Coalition's website hosting the donor principles. And you can also find there an email address related to the donor principles. It's donorprinciples at freedomonlinecoalition.com. And so that's where we invite anybody who has questions, wants to get involved, um, to reach out and we will respond to you. So with no further ado, we will kick off the, oh actually let me just also say, so the first portion of this event will be the launch of the Donor Principles where you'll be hearing from speakers on this lovely panel you see up here as well as two speakers online. Um, and then after the official launch, we will break out into uh, breakout groups and actually dig into you know, what it is that we should be doing in order to implement these principles. So we'll be collecting feedback from all of you so that we have a vision for next steps, um, given that you know, we have all of you here with us for the launch. It's a great opportunity to actually think about action. Um, so now, with no further ado, I am delighted to introduce Vera Zakam, USAID's Chief Digital Democracy and Rights Officer, who will provide opening remarks. Vera, over to you. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you to everyone uh, who is gathered here today. I know it's also early morning, uh, so, uh, but you know, we really, really are grateful because we just really think this is such a momentous and exciting opportunity for us to roll out these principles and also what they mean uh, for uh, strengthening uh, rights respecting rights respecting digital ecosystem. So again, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. Um, I am pleased to announce that as of last week, the donor principles have been officially endorsed by 38 uh, member governments of the Freedom Online Coalition. Uh, some of whom you will hear today. Uh, the donor principles establish international framework for donor uh, accountability and, co and cooperation on digital issues that align with donor ethical obligations to do no harm. Earlier this month, uh, Freedom House released the annual Freedom on the Net report, a survey and analysis of internet freedom around the world, and we see that the global internet freedom has declined for 13th consecutive year in a row. Uh, the donor principles commit donor governments, including the United States, to reverse, uh, to reverse the trend. They call on the donors to safeguard international assistance from digital repression by establishing procedures to protect local partners and communities from the potential misuse of digital technologies and data. 
Over the past two decades, USAID and other donors have supported many digital initiatives around the world with there are, say, positive outcomes. We have assisted countries to digitize their public service delivery systems from healthcare to education to participatory budgeting. We've also supported young entrepreneurs to develop financing, financial technology or fintech applications that have created new economic opportunities for those who have been exclude, excluded from traditional economic systems. At the same time, we have witnessed how governments have used digital data to target and threaten journalists and activists in Central America. We have seen how fintech companies have weaponized the personal data of poor people through predatory digital lending practices. We've learned how consulting firms have exploited citizens' personal data to influence their voting behavior in ways that undermine freedom of thought and expression and fundamentally weaken public trust in democratic institutions. Such examples are common and are cause for concern, but digital transformation, we know, does not have to come at the expense of digital rights. Uh, as donor governments, we can best fulfill our mandate when we put safety and security uh, at the heart uh, of these issues and the values of democracy, respect for human rights and accountability really at the heart and the center of our work. Um, I am, suffice to say, I'm very pleased to be here with colleagues and partners from governments civil society and the private sectors who have demonstrated their commitment to these values. Uh, I believe and USCID believes it's only through this multi-stakeholder process and multilateral collaboration that we can fulfill the promise and the intent of these principles. Uh, I certainly want to thank uh, the Freedom Online, uh, Freedom Online Coalition Support Unit who've made this event possible and the donor principles themselves. I also thank uh, our panelists in the room and online. Uh, where is Yus? Uh, I don't think it's right here, thank you. Yus <laughs> uh, from the Netherlands, USAID of course is very much looking forward to working with you as uh, Netherlands takes chairmanship of the Freedom Online Coalition next year. Estonia's digital ambassador uh, that we have here, Nile Lisk, uh, again, congratulations to you for hosting phenomenal uh, Tallinn Digital Summit and Open Government Partnership uh, last month in Tallinn. Uh, Kenya's commissioner, uh, uh, Online, okay, good. Uh, Kenya's Commissioner for Data Protection, Immaculate Kasait. Uh, we commend you for the work that you are doing to keep Kenyans safe and look forward to partnering with you on digital governance as Kenya begins co-chairmanship of the OGP, Open Government Partnership Steering Committee. Um, and from the FOC Advisory Network, Juan uh, Carlos Lara, uh, the executive director of Derechos Digitales, and Zach Lampel, senior legal advisor from the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law. We deeply appreciate your support in drafting the donor principles, and of course, very much look forward to working with you. And of course, Michael Car Karimian from Microsoft, we really appreciate your company's uh, commitment to democratic values and respect for human rights. Uh, I also want to express uh, especially deep gratitude to our Canadian colleagues from the International Development Research Center who have co-chaired the Freedom Online Coalition's funding coordination group with us this year and co-led the donor principles drafting and negotiating process. So huge thanks to you. Uh, the donor principles reflect the U.S. and Canada's shared commitment for digital inclusion uh, with the support of the FOC support unit and the US Department of State, uh, US and IDRC co-led the first ever public consultation process for the FOC deliverable, which yielded inputs and insights from civil society, um, academia, and the private sector from, and various stakeholders from around the world. As a result, uh, the principles better address the needs and desires of the communities that we seek that they serve. And finally, I'm so pleased, and USAID at large is pleased to be here in partnership with our colleagues from the Department of State's uh, Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, uh, 
it goes without saying that your collaboration on uh, everything with the Freedom Online Coalition, this uh, principles would not be part of, if possible. So I am especially delighted to turn over to the Deputy Assistant Secretary at DRL, Allison Peters, a dear friend and colleague who's been really working hand in arm with all of us to really uh, enable these principles to come to life. Over to you. Thanks so much, Vera, um, and especially to Lisa for your tireless leadership uh, getting these principles over the finish line. It is not uh, ever easy negotiating anything in a multilateral, multi-stakeholder process, and we really appreciate your leadership. Uh, and also to Sydney and IDRC for your, your strong partnership in this effort. Um, thanks all for joining us. We know it's an early morning. Uh, we hope everyone is well caffeinated, but this is a really, really um, momentous and exciting occasion to launch these donor principles. So uh, we're grateful that you took the time to join us this morning. Um, the Department of State and the U.S. government as a whole view the Freedom Online Coalition as a key indispensable partner in our efforts to promote and protect human rights and the use of digital technologies globally. Pretty much every issue set that we have heard discussed here at IGF is a core priority of the work that we're doing with the other governments and the Freedom Online Coalition to promote human rights online. As the chair this year of the Freedom Online Coalition, the United States made a firm commitment to work within the FOC and with our partners and allies to promote and protect fundamental freedoms, counter the rise of digital authoritarianism and the misuse of digital technologies, advanced norms, safeguards, and principles for artificial intelligence based on human rights, and support ongoing initiatives to promote safe online spaces for marginalized and vulnerable groups. As we heard from our Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, at the UN General Assembly, uh, which feels like 100 years ago now, but was just a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we are delivering. These principles launching today really translate these priorities into action, giving donor governments concrete guidance to hold fast to our commitment to invest in digital technologies only when it is possible to protect against their potential misuse. They reinforce the Freedom Online Coalition's shared vision to enable individual dignity and economic prosperity. Technology should be harnessed in a manner that is open, sustainable, secure, and respectable of democratic values and human rights, and these donor principles will help us take one step in that direction. They also demonstrate our shared commitment to advancing the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. As we look to harness the power of digital technologies in a rights-respecting manner to advance our shared goals from achieving gender equality to promoting inclusive and peaceful societies. As our Secretary of State stated at the UN General Assembly, we can develop the best technologies in the world, but if we haven't determined how to govern them in partnership with those who share our values, these technologies are likely to be misused for repressive or destabilizing purposes, making our communities less peaceful, less prosperous, less secure, and unfortunately more undermining of human rights. They're also less likely to be leveraged for advancing societal progress around the globe. So again, I thank you all for joining us today. We have both an exciting panel with some key partners and we're thrilled uh, to be joined by the government of the Netherlands who are turning over the chairship of the FOC to, to next year. Uh, but we're really thrilled to also join you in the breakout sessions to hear your thoughts on these donor principles and how we can move them forward through the FOC. So thank you again and thank you again to Lisa and Vera for your leadership. Thank you, Allison. Thank you very much, and thank you for the, to the U.S. really for the commitment and dedication in that uh, in getting through the uh, principles. Uh, I think that was uh, an important process and and a uh, and, uh, uh, yeah decisive one. So, but uh, you you already made the, the transition uh, actually to a first uh, pick here uh, in the panel uh, from the Netherlands, and uh, I'll I'll turn over to you uh, to you guys. Uh, yes, uh, Van Zolt, who is a senior policy officer at the Human Rights and Political Ref Legal Affairs uh, in the Netherlands. And as you take over uh, the chairship in 2024, it'll be interesting to hear from you the, the intention uh, to implement the donor principles in that uh, chairship in 2024. Over to you. Thank you, Sydney. <clears throat> First of all, thank you, USAID, and thank you, IDRC, for 
really bringing something new to the table here at the F for, at the FOC. I think that's great that you were able to to create these principles, not only tying all these different important topics that we've been hearing the last few days about, really like connecting the unconnected, but tying that into the rights agendas that we have been discussing in our little side sessions the last few days. And I think it's an important bridge, not only indeed in, in, in getting the development goals getting to the development goals or reaching the development goals, but also tying, uh, I mean, it will be an important step for us, at least from a policy side also, to, 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 to get where we need to be in order to, to have a fruitful discussions with reaching to the GDC and the Wessels Plus 20. So I think it's a great important step, not only from a, from a digitalization pr perspective or, or, or an aid perspective, but also really connecting it to, our, to the more rights, human rights related discussions that we are having as well. And also thank you for setting a really high bar that will be very difficult to reach in forms of, <laughs> of having an open multi-stakeholder process. I mean, it's, you've, done, you've done an excellent job in that and I really want to gra congratulate you. I rather had it that you would do it after our chairship because <laughs> <laughs> it will be so challenging to, 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 to work to that high standard. But it's, 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 it's a great inspiration for us and we'll really try to continue that line of work as well next year. I mean, uh, under your ch under your under the guidance of the USAID and IDRC, of course, in partnership with the US State uh, Department, uh, you really set up these important donor principles that encompass the basic conditions for human rights centered di di digital development programming. But, however, at least for us, this would be only be the beginning. I mean, turning these principles into locally driven action that truly serves the target communities that we support within the context of our very diverse coalition, that is really the big task that, that still lies ahead of us. And during our upcoming chairship, the Netherlands therefore wants to see how we can adapt these principles in, into even more concrete tools that can be used in, by our community of, to practice and integrate them into the activities that we support. And this can only be done through cooperation between our members, in close cooperation with our local and implementing partners, who, whose needs and challenges are central to any solution. Um, we de will therefore also ask all of our members, or all of our the Freedom Online member states, to share also their practice, best practices, uh, either as a donor or a recipient. I mean, given the, 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 the multi-regional multi um, um, build-up of our coalition, this would be a great chance to, 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 see, the si uh, see, to see it from both sides. And also, as the Netherlands, <coughs> these these principles will be key, and uh, it will be a great way in 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 in, in connecting the, the development work and tying it to to important to to tie the, the the agenda that we have on 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 digitalization and tying it indeed to to um, to to connect connectivity, security, and and good governance because we 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 see it sometimes that we have these high level discussions at the OEWG that are very difficult and we see that there it's, it's a certain set of countries that are very active in that. And we need to, to reach out and make sure that, that those the last third of the, of the world that's unconnected will be able to, uh, to connect, but that also will have to have the cybersecurity tools to, to keep that structure secure. And then of course have, an, have a good human rights set of principles to govern that structure as, as Alison really, really much more detailed pointed out. Thank you for that. <laughs> I think I will leave it at this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hughes, and I have no doubt that you will able to even exceed the work that we have done this year in your FOC chairship next year. So we look forward to partnering with you. No pressure. <laughs> Um, so now I'm very pleased to introduce to Nele Leosk, the digital ambassador at large from Estonia. Nele, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'm glad to be here uh, in this very, very early hour. And I'm glad to see also so many other, <laughs> uh, many, so many other people here. But uh, actually last uh, month we celebrated a little birthday in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs because 25 years passed since Estonia became a donor. From, uh, from a recipient side uh, to a donor, uh, so it, we have this both, uh, both experiences and, and perhaps I will just complement these principles uh, by uh, some practical, I would say, takeaways from, uh, 
uh, from our 25 years, out of which I would say 15 uh, digital has been a priority. And, uh, and I know that we uh, have been discussing here over the past days and also today quite a bit of everything that can go wrong with technology. And, uh, and in a way, I believe it's also an increasingly trendy to talk about. It's, of course, very timely and very much needed conversation. But it seems to me that we are also, at the same time, forgetting about everything that uh, technology can bring. And, uh, and in this sense, Estonia, I, I believe, is a good reminder that technology actually can be used to build democracy. Technology can be used to enhance economy, to rebuild trust, to build openness, transparency, and Estonia has all, all done this, and this has, I believe, also been the reason for interest in our, uh, our experience, because it's, it's not about digitalization, it's, uh, it's not to become uh, the, the world leader in, uh, uh, in digital, uh, di digital services, it's really about uh, democratizing your uh, state and the opportunities um, uh, it gives. So, so for us, uh, digitalization and these principles that we're also talking about here have actually been horizontally integrated in different programs. And not only, uh, I would say, our development or economic policy or, or trade policies, but currently also in our tech diplomacy. So these principles that we are talking about here somehow need to be implemented because uh, just talking about the principles will also not uh, get us uh, get us very um, uh, very far and actually um, digitalization through development cooperation has been one of these very practical ways how we build a democratic state and uh, and there were some examples here in these principles for example um, uh, data governance and, and management so it is clear that in order to introduce a data governance or management system. For example, in Estonia, we have this famous uh, system called X-Road. It's uh, our interoperability layer that allows to exchange data. In order for this to work, you need to create also an ecosystem and a supporting legal framework and policies. You must have uh, access to Information Act. You must have uh, uh, the uh, open standards and, and so forth and so forth. So this, in a way, creates this... Um, uh, I would say, democratic ecosystem. But one other uh, aspect, that we were discussing about it um, uh, yesterday uh, evening in, uh, also over the party, um, is actually that often we forget that it's the development is not about us. Uh, and in order to really uh, reach these principles, it is actually about uh, also the receiving side. So we really need to put the emphasis in building the capacity of the others to the level of us and even beyond. And we have a very good example, uh, a practical example from long uh, cooperation with Ukraine, for example. Uh, over the past 14 years, we have been working closely in supporting Ukraine to build their uh, democratic system. And we can see now that in many areas, they may also exceed all of us in this, uh, uh, in this room. So it's really about the other side and, and not that much uh, um, um, of us in, uh, uh, in this uh, journey. I believe my, my time is almost uh, uh, finished, but, uh, but the, uh, uh, I wanted to bring maybe just um, uh, quickly three main priorities for us um, that are also horizontal issues. And, and actually one of them is a gender divide. Um, uh, which is also integrated in all our policies and, uh, and, uh, uh, and action plans and is also the priority uh, for, for tech diplomacy and, um, and in a way my own, uh, my own work. Uh, the other is um, the working with private sector. Uh, our development agency is only two years old, so uh, it, it has been mainly through the partnership with uh, uh, private companies and other organizations that we carry out our uh, our, our policies and, and the third is actually about openness and, uh, and uh, that also tr uh, translates to technological openness. So we support um, uh, open source uh, in our development uh, cooperation not to uh, uh, get uh, anybody hooked and, uh, and have also more control and transparency over these processes. So this is maybe very shortly about how we have approached it. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thanks for a great reminder the, of the democratic potential 
uh, and and also the importance of of, uh, of building capacity. Uh, but you were starting by saying that it's uh, uh, it's it's really early. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, for uh, our next speaker, uh, who uh, is based in Kenya, uh, it's very late. Uh, so, but but it's late. even more uh, uh, my, my pleasure uh, to 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 introduce and to welcome uh, Immaculate Kasai, the Data Protection Commissioner. Um, uh, from, from Kenya. So, Commissioner, over to you. Uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me. You can hear Perfectly. me. Perfectly. All right. Uh, it's, it's very early. It's actually 3 a.m. in Kenya. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Ambassador, and uh, my fellow panelists, and the USA um, and Netherlands, for the opportunity to participate in this panel. I'll try as much as possible to summarize. I think it's a very exciting moment to be discussing key principles for donors in terms of the, in this era of digital, uh, in the era of digital era, when we are discussing governance. And uh, we, I, I liked what was spoken earlier, that uh, if we could quickly be evolving into digitalization and uh, we're not talking about governance, this could lead to misuse and destabilize many economies. Uh, of course, from a data protection perspective, we are often seen as the people who hold back development as a, as a, and I interfere with innovations because we are put there to actually then ask questions in as far as data protection is concerned. As an office, just a quick one, this office has been there for three years now. It was established um, in, uh, in 2020, but the act came into force in 2019. And really our role is to regulate the processing of personal data based on certain principles, which I would say are very common across all data protection authorities. Our ours is to make sure that when we talk about the right to privacy, it's actually not just a, a right we speak about, it's a right that is actually uh, implemented by the Kenyan government. That makes sure that the, the social justice orientation of the society um, on top of that, as an institution, we have the, been mandated to establish the legal and institutional framework, uh, provide the rights of the data subject. Some of the key issues um, that we've been able to achieve in this short time, of course, is guidance notes as an office. We are members. Uh, we are members. We, we are members of three international bodies. We will be hosting uh, the Network for Data Protection Authorities in the coming year. We have established a register of the data protection um, controller, data pro controllers, and we have a strategic plan. What I'd like to just speak about is uh, we have uh, had uh, 2,761 complaints and have actually enforced almost three, uh, almost six uh, penalty notices. Uh, the recent one, which was like a week ago, was to do with people using personal photos of children and uh, also using, um, using people's photos in social places and also unsolicited information, not unsolicited messages. And that comes to the point that many times uh, in the process of marketing, uh, many controllers are not paying attention to that this is personal information and we must, take, uh, we must be held to account. Uh, of course, as an office, uh, there are challenges and I'm happy we have this conversation. Um, we are finding ourselves in a situation where we don't have adequate laws in some cases, uh, where in, in the context of when we developed the Data Protection Act, it came up to, we, we, were, we did not anticipate to have multinationals which have not registered in Kenya. Of course, being a new office, resources are never adequate. And of course, advancement in technology, we are seeing AI as one of the issues. But coming now to the highlight, in as far as the issues around the donor principles for human rights, what does this mean for us when we say we need to commit to doing no harm in the digital uh, uh, age uh, while enhancing technology and also ensuring that we're increasing donors' accountability? I see several areas horizontally for areas of collaboration. On the, some of the areas of, part of collaboration, when we say donor support and um, country being aligned in terms of their legal framework, I see the need for support in as far as uh, reviewing of uh, current legal framework and related framework. And for those countries that don't have existing data protection uh, framework, they need to actually then help them so that we're not leaving other countries behind uh, in as far as uh, data governance is concerned. Sharing expertise, some countries are ahead. Uh, I think it would be important to collaborate and come up with some of the guidance notes 
guidance as far as this is concerned. They need to, uh, we also need to leverage on the government agenda on technology. Uh, in our case, as a country, we are digitalizing over 5,000, we have digitalized over 5,000 government services and uh, there is need for, they need for leveraging uh, what others have done. Sharing best practices, uh, of course, in terms of uh, collaboration with private sector, we see an opportunity there to facilitate partnership with private sector and uh, recipient, uh, recipient countries to encourage right-based respect. And I would say, uh, I would see this also more of uh, the, the data protection by default and by design. Capacity building is another area for collaboration and technical support, supporting training programs, uh, of course, when it comes to for fostering coordination, I see joint advocacy effort as one of the things that we can also do. Uh, support on the growth of rights, respect, and technology as a principle, I see us. Uh, I see one of the areas of co collaboration is facilitating training initiative, advocating for professional codes of ethics, and of course, facilitating exchange uh, of information. When it comes to prioritizing of uh, uh, digital security, the need to provide for resources and of course capacity building. I think I don't take too much of the time. I want to thank you once again for the opportunity and I really welcome the conversation around uh, the, the, the principles and it being launched here is a really big milestone for, 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 for donor countries, for partners and, and especially in this era of technology where we are now being held to account and holding other people to account so that it's not just development, it's not just technology for the sake of it, it's technology that adheres to human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Kasait, for those remarks. I think you provided a really nice um, bridge for us to start thinking about implementation by offering some concrete ideas of how we could partner with other countries around the world, not only donor countries, but um, all countries around the world. So really appreciate that um, and appreciate your remarks and the work that you do. Um, so I wanted to now turn it over to Juan Carlos Lara, who is the executive director of Derechos Digitales and who has played an instrumental role in um, the drafting process uh, for these principles. Juan Carlos. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, evening, afternoon to people attending online. Um, I wish to first introduce myself. I am a member of an organization that works on digital rights in the global majority, specifically in Latin America. And for us, it's very important to interact with governments and with donor uh, governments, especially considering the role that they have in funding much of the work that organizations like mine do in the global maj majority. Uh, and that depends on the support that we can uh, obtain from different funders. In that regard, um, it's also heartening to hear so much about uh, having countries um, be accountable or, or having put principles that will lead to action and other types of uh, language that represents an intention to bring all the good intentions that countries often uh, present into concrete steps, into concrete uh, things. And the donor principles in that regard um, are a product of an interaction, of an exchange of ideas and views that in many ways represented uh, what our priorities are for civil society in the global, global majority. Understanding as well that uh, we need uh, the support uh, not just to conduct uh, work uh, that we like, but also to create change and to promote social justice and to generate conditions for a responsible development that is respectful of human rights and that is centered around uh, the people. Um, I wish to, uh, before I close my remarks, I wish to uh, recognize those efforts and at the same time uh, recognize the fact that whether we see this as a fruitful steps, uh, fr fr fruitful thing is going to be shown by the implementation process. Um, as much as we would like to recognize this as a, a, a the beginning of something very uh, inspiring, we also need to see how this translates into action. And to the question about the, uh, the opportunities that this presents for advocacy for organizations like mine, uh, it's also very positive to see that the principles recognize the, the need for coordination with stakeholders and the need to admit also um, 
participation of different people, participation of different stakeholders and recognition of human rights in issues such as technological development. Um, so I think that one of the most important things that we can see here is that uh, when we put the idea of the priorities of states into action uh, that we need for advocacy organizations is that those priorities should come from the advocacy organizations and should come from the ground of the people that are doing this work. And that donor governments, donor institutions need to uh, recognize that that's where the knowledge comes from, from what is needed uh, on the ground. And that uh, the position of certain officials, uh, it's better informed when they have that type of interaction and when they can foster collaboration between different stakeholders in order to promote human rights. So thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Juan Carlos, and, and, and we cannot uh, agree uh, more uh, on the importance of localized knowledge and evidence uh, at IDRC for sure. Uh, and I'll turn to, to uh, Zach uh, Lambel, the Senior Legal Advisor for the International Center for Nonprofit Law, uh, who is online. And I hope, yes? Yes, thank you, Sydney. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Great. Well, thank you all. Uh, so very much. My apologies that I could not be with you all in person in Kyoto, but I know and trust you all having a great time. Uh, before I begin my very brief remarks, I wanted to quickly introduce myself. I'm Zach Lampel, Senior Legal Advisor with the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, where I lead our global digital rights programming and where we work in over 100 countries uh, to ensure that the legal framework supports civil society and promotes and protects the freedoms of expression, association, assembly, and the right to privacy. I want to also thank uh, the whole Freedom Online Coalition, the support unit, and the member states, and especially the U.S. government, USAID, and the U.S. State Department for their leadership in developing these principles, as well as Sydney and his team with IDRC, uh, the co-authors and co-leaders of the principles. I'd also like to thank the funding coordination group, the rest of the drafting committee, and finally, everyone who provided feedback, comments, and suggestions, especially all of those from civil society organizations in the global majority. I'd like to now briefly present three ways in which civil society can use the donor principles for advocacy. First, internationally. I would encourage all civil society organizations to collaborate with donor governments as those donor governments develop their strategic priorities and institutionalize their processes to shape their foreign assistance. Like uh, Juan Carlos was saying, let them know what you're seeing on the ground. Let these donor governments know what has worked, what concerns you have, and most importantly, articulate what gaps there are in domestic legislation. And finally, utilize existing processes like the UPR to obtain firm commitments from your governments to improve the legal framework. So that's internationally. Domestically, work with donor governments to encourage and facilitate real, meaningful, multi-stakeholder, open, public processes for drafting legislation. Be sure to reference all of the international legal obligations and frameworks on which these principles are based and work with both your governments and the donor community uh, to ensure that these principles and international human rights standards are being upheld in the legal framework. Finally, technically, and this is one of the principles, but work to push for inclusion into standard setting bodies. If you or your organization or your partners do not have the knowledge base to effectively engage with these standard setting bodies, reach out to the international community, donor governments, international NGOs, so you can develop and build your knowledge base. So that way you can impact the work of these technical bodies. Work to ensure that human rights protections are built into the infrastructure of the internet. Work with private companies to help create products, services, and design systems that place human rights at the forefront. So again, internationally, domestically, and technically, there are ways for civil society to use these principles 
to advocate for an improved legal framework, improved product and services, and an improved internet infrastructure, all of which uh, we believe will lead to the change and support promotion and protection of democratic principles that we all seek. Thank you again so much, and I look forward to rolling out these principles and working with all of you then. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Zach, and, and you've probably uh, uh, given us the, uh, the kind of the structure for implementation internationally, domestically, and, and technically, so th thanks so much. Uh, let me turn to uh, Michael Karimian, uh, Director for Digital Diplomacy, Asia and the Pacific uh, from Microsoft uh, to also provide a private sector perspective on, on, on the donor principles. Thank you very much, Sydney. And indeed, a private sector perspective, not necessarily the whole of private sector. But thank you to FOC, USAID, and IDRC for the opportunity to join today's discussion. It's very nice to follow on from Zach. Zach and I did some work together a few years ago. Uh, I have a lot of respect for him and his organization. I work on Microsoft's digital diplomacy team, which seeks to advance responsible state and non-state behavior in cyberspace, grounded in international law and norms, including the international human rights regime. I previously worked on Microsoft's human rights team, which seeks to uh, uphold Microsoft's corporate responsibility to respect human rights, grounded in the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. And it's great to see the UNGPs uh, accurately uh, integrated throughout the principles here. Indeed, as Sydney mentioned, I'll offer a quick reflection on current application of the principles and some of the ways to uh, move forward where there's perhaps some gaps in application. So looking particularly at principle three, uh, within that there's reference to donor government should also emphasize the need for industry to remain accountable to address critical feedback from society and human rights defenders. I think firstly that requires that donors are very specific in either encouraging or even mandating that companies uh, uh, uphold the second pillar of the UN guidance principles on business and human rights, mainly by having a human rights policy in place signed off at the most senior level publicly available and implemented by accountable teams and with the right degree of transparency and that of course should include a commitment to respect the work of human rights defenders additionally that also requires both states and uh, companies to uphold the third pillar of the united nations guidance principles which is access to remedy and you do that through grievance mechanisms both judicial grievance mechanisms and non-judicial grievance mechanisms so that's a mix of mechanisms coming from the state from law enforcement and from regulatory bodies as well as the more informal non-judicial grievance mechanisms which can be uh, implemented by companies, civil society or other actors. And again, companies are, should be expected to respect uh, and participate in such processes and not to hinder them. There is an important recognition in the principles around the fact that transnational private sector companies often have weak direct connections to local civil society stakeholders. This is a huge challenge. This is where platforms such as the IGF come into play as well as regional IGFs and local IGFs. I would also call out uh, organizations which have tremendous civil society networks around the world such as Access Now. And Brett Solomon is pleased to see uh, Brett is in the room. Uh, Access Now is a, an incredible organization who has a tremendous network which has certainly helped Microsoft be better at having those direct connections with uh, civil society organizations in global majority countries. Additionally, in the principles, there's a reference that donors can and should hold private sector partners accountable. Uh, this absolutely goes back to the fact that donors, I think, should have a high expectation that companies should be undertaking human rights due diligence so, so that the actual uh, inclusive, sustainable, and rights respecting business investments are being made. And human rights due diligence requires that companies are undertaking ongoing practices which are transparent. They must include stakeholders, including civil society, to assess and address actual and potential human rights impacts. Quickly turn into principle seven, support the growth of rights respect in technology workforce. Within there, there's reference to donors should encourage these products to be built in alignment with respect for human rights and democratic values by upholding or supporting, I should say, inclusive human rights by design processes. I would actually take that down a step further and uh, make sure that there's a focus on so-called salient human rights. So the human rights that are most at risk by business activities. And that's generally understood to be the human rights risks where there's the highest uh, degree of scale, scope, and re remediability challenges posed by those business practices. And for most technology companies, that means privacy by design, accessibility by design, and increasingly responsible AI by design. And that requires having policies in place, accountable teams in place, and again, the right degree of transparency. 
Lastly, there's mention in principle seven around a professional code of ethics for individuals, organizations, and institutions. This is a challenge. Many have looked at this before. So for example, can you have uh, you know, software engineers having a code of conducts that are, are taught in university courses? The challenge there is those university degrees, especially at the highest uh, level universities, students have very little scope for optional courses. The, the mandatory courses are already very full, and so it's hard to add anything into that curriculum. But actually, you don't need to let perfect be the enemy of the good. There are lots of interim steps. So donors should make sure that companies have the right standards of business conduct in place and making sure that there is the right degree of training for staff throughout the company so that they understand what are their responsibilities, they understand the structures that are in place just to seek additional guidance if they need to, they should also have access to additional training if they want to have it, and most importantly they should know where to go to within the company for additional expertise on these subject matters. I'll stop there and very much look forward to the breakout sessions. Thank you so much, Michael, and what a rich set of remarks for us to think about when we start the implementation conversation in, in a minute. Thanks so much for that. Um, so before we move into the second portion of our event, we will hear from, last but not least, um, Shannon Hello. Green, who... <laughs> Shannon Green, who is the assistant to the administrator for the Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance at USAID, and she will be joining us, as you can see, via video. Thank you. Hello. I am delighted to join you to celebrate the launch of the Donor Principles for Human Rights in the Digital Age, and I commend the 38-member governments of the Freedom Online Coalition who have endorsed these principles and supported their development. These principles provide an important blueprint to protect and uphold the rights of individuals in our digital world. They commit donor governments, including my own agency, to hold ourselves accountable for the role we play in shaping the global digital ecosystem. The principles encourage donors to examine our own internal structures and processes and introduce safeguards for all programs. These safeguards will help ensure that the benefits of digital transformation are equitably distributed. They will also promote safer and more secure environments for partners and local communities. Donors have much to learn from our partners around the world in government, civil society, and the private sector. You heard earlier from Commissioner Kasait, who has been leading Kenya's Office of Data Protection. These authorities are the safeguards that protect us from the darker aspects of the digital age. It is more important than ever that donors partner with them in their critical mission to better protect the public and increase transparency. USAID is also energized by the Open Government Partnership, or OGP's, recent announcement of digital governance as a priority issue. This will strengthen the transparency of public oversight of artificial intelligence and data processing systems. We have seen remarkable progress under OGP commitments. And in this spirit, on behalf of USAID, I am pleased to issue a call to action for other donor governments to join USAID in making concrete commitments aligned with the donor principles. Internally, Donors can make commitments to integrate human rights impact assessments into their program design and evaluation processes. They can also allocate dedicated funding to support partners and local communities' digital security. Externally, donors can better support partner countries to develop and implement strong legal and regulatory frameworks or equip oversight bodies to better protect the public and hold powerful actors accountable. Civil society and tech companies, large and small, should consider how they can most effectively use the principles to encourage responsible donor behavior. For more information, please visit the Freedom Online Coalition's website. We look forward to hearing what concrete actions donors commit to at the Third Summit for Democracy in the Republic of Korea, where the United States government plans to launch its own efforts. The Donor Principles for Human Rights in the Digital Age help contribute to a digital future that respects rights, promotes democracy, and ensures that the benefits of technology are shared by all. Let us act with determination and vision to fulfill its promise. Thank you, Shannon. Um, and with that, we will conclude the official launch of the Donor Principles for Human Rights in the Digital Age. Um, and we will now move into breakout groups. So I'm going to invite Zora, who is 
over there in the corner um, to facilitate the process of getting all of you into breakout groups. There won't be too much movement. And then maybe I'll also just say if you have not signed in via the sign-up sheet, um, the sign-in sheet that is going around, uh, we will also send it around again, and then we'll leave it on the, um, uh, the table right next to the entrance and exit so that we can continue to keep in touch around implementation of the donor principles after this event. Zora. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining us. Um, as Lisa said, we will be um, going ahead with our breakout uh, groups. So what we're going to do is we're going to be breaking out in five groups, so four groups here physically, and then um, everyone who's joining us online will have their own breakout group and they their own moderator. Um, so I would like to ask um, everyone who's in the room um, just to move to the four different corners of the room, I think, make it out of your own choice. <laughs> I'm not going to be separating you, so just, just um, direct yourself to one of the corners. Um, I will be going around, and we have about four questions, which you can see now on the screen. Um, maybe I'll just um, give over to Lisa, just to explain maybe the questions in a bit. Uh, but one final thing for me is that we'll have about 15 minutes for the breakout groups, after which we'll come back into plenary just to quickly uh, discuss what has been discussed in the breakout groups. Uh, we have our, our own uh, facilitators um, um, who will be um, taking your contributions, um, after which um, we will be taking them and summarizing them and making sure that we will use that towards the next steps following the, um, the launch of Donor Principles. And I think that's it for me. Hey, thanks, Zora. Um, so just to provide a little bit of structure, as you heard many of our panelists uh, note, there is sort of an internal component to the donor principles, and there is an external component. So on the one hand, we're thinking about what can donor governments do internally in terms of their own processes and structures to uphold the donor principles. And then also we're thinking about what can donors support externally um, and programmatically in order to uphold the donor principles. So we've structured each of the questions around that internal internal and external component. Um, we're gonna run this kind of like a speed dating situation. So each group will have um, a few minutes to focus on each question, and then the group will remain the same, and we'll just move to focus on a different question every few minutes. Zora will announce a, uh, a loud buzz or something <laughs> to, to indicate. Um, and so it's you'll get to have a sort of a cohesive conversation um, across the entire period of the breakout group. You can stay with your group and pick up on conversations that you had uh, as the questions move along. Um, and I think that is it. Anything? Okay, and to our online group, um, we will do our very best to incorporate you um, in the, the discussion afterwards, and so don't think we're forgetting about you. We value that you're there as well. Um, so let's break out into groups, and if everyone can kind of migrate to the corner that you're closest to, uh, we'd appreciate that.
Hello, everyone. If I can just um, ask you to move to the next question. Thank you.
Hello again. Um, just asking everyone if they can move to the next question. If they haven't already, thank you. May I ask everyone just to move to the last question? We have the last four minutes. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. I just wanted to say that uh, we are at time. And if I might just ask everyone to go back to their seats so we can come back to plenary. Thank you. Everyone can stay in the same chairs if you're in the room or um, and just turn them or you can get up and move back, but um, we do need to move back to plenary at this point and we'll continue the conversation. We won't just be reporting out. Okay, so we're going to um, have a continued discussion. So we won't be reporting out necessarily from groups, but we'll invite any of you to raise your hands either in the room or raise your hands online if you wanna make a comment. Um, and we'll just start with one of the questions around um, implementation internally in donor governments that Elle and I, who don't know where Elle and I, oh, I think she went to the bathroom. Um, so Elle and I from GNI asked a question about what it would look like in donor governments like for USAID or IDRC um, to implement these processes. Um, and then somebody else whose name I'm forgetting, um, but feel free to chime in, um, asked a question around not burdening um, those who are receiving funding, such as implementing partners, grantees, um, from having to do extra work themselves in order to implement these principles. So just invite anybody to uh, maybe give thoughts on that. I'm sure this has come up in multiple groups. So we'll just turn the floor over to anyone who has any ideas around that or want to expand on that idea of implementing the principles internally without burdening grantees and implementing partners uh, with additional labor. We can start with um, IDRC, maybe Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> or if you want to repeat what it was, Ruhia, that you said in the, the session. Um, I mean, first of all, I can't speak for all of the programming that happens at IDRC, but I think for, um, for those of us who work in technology, we already take these things into consideration a lot. Um, and I think what I would want to try to do is, is socialize this across our research, our, my colleagues, and begin to talk to them about, for instance, um, providing more digital security and digital resilience as a portion of a, of a budget, um, and to work with grantees who are, you know, for instance, if it's a, a health application and there's a, you know, what are the data governance practices? Um, because not everyone's on the same page with these issues, right? I mean, they're thinking of different human rights outcomes around access to health or, you know, access to clean water. So how can we begin that conversation with an IDRC? Would you agree? Anyone want to add to that or have a follow-on question? 
Quinn. And please just introduce yourself when you sure. come on mic. Is this on? Yes, thanks. Um, yes, I'm Quinn McHugh, the Executive Director for Article 19. We work on implementing a freedom of expression approach and human rights-based approach to bridge technology and policy and human rights actors. Um, I just wanted to echo what she was saying. One of the things that we see quite frequently when we are submitting grant proposals for Article 19 and in negotiations with donor governments is we will put in a line for safety and security and it is one of the most frequently questioned lines we have in our proposal. People are like, what's this for? Um, can this be only to demonstrate the safety and security for specific actors in this program and not for the organizations themselves to build robust digital security and resilience practices, which are about keeping our partners safe as well. And so that's just something to echo a little bit. I think it'd be really useful in terms of the implementation if there was maybe a broader um, understanding of the importance of these kinds of, these kinds of lines in the proposals that we're submitting. And maybe this is something that can be echoed from kind of yourselves down to your colleagues that maybe having a bit broader understanding of digital security and resilience and how that programming should be incorporated into some of the work with grantees. Um, so it's not just, again, specific to is someone being given an emergency training or something like that. It would be very helpful. That's really useful, thank you. Um, are there specific actors, this can be directed to you or anybody else, that <clears throat> we should bring to the table or existing networks that um, we can leverage or bring in as partners in order to socialize these very issues to others across all of our respective development agencies who uh, may not have the knowledge of what digital security might look like <clears throat> in a solicitation process and who should actually be involved and who should be protected? Well, I mean, we work on this. I mean, Access Now, pretty much every organization that's going to be here in civil society could provide something. But um, in terms of donors themselves, the Ford Foundation is actually really good at, at building the idea of capacity building into the grants that they give as well. I'm sure there's other funders here, but that's just one I'm very familiar with. Like, they have a very open dialogue-based approach and more expansive in terms of looking at issues of security, not just from technical things, but like, economic, social, cultural elements of digital security and safety as well, um, looking at the more kind of a holistic approach to it. So I would suggest if you're looking for another kind of donor to speak to on some of their practices, they've been very good. Thank you. What about, oh, go ahead, Daniela. Um, yeah, Daniela from GPD, just wanted to echo that, that came up in our, in our group around being more creative in terms of reaching more groups and going beyond the usual suspects and reach communities that are usually marginalized. And that goes back to the the very clear point that, that was made earlier about that bottom-up approach. But also we discussed how these principles can be leveraged, not just um, with uh, donor governments, but also um, increasing collaboration with private foundations. So that came up um, as well. So yeah, just echoing that and supporting that point. Thank you. Are there specific fora um, where maybe these ideas are not socialized as much? So thinking about other major development conferences or like even the G20 process um, or other spaces where we might want to work on socializing these ideas so that our colleagues who work on digital health or digital economy um, can, can start to learn more about how they can facilitate more digital security. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Apologies for my voice. It's Sylvia Kain, APNIC Foundation. Um, I, I just wanted to say that there are so many events and principles and processes that small and medium and large organizations are supposed to figure it out by themselves um, that it would be very useful to have, when you talk about mechanisms and tools for implementation, it would be really good to have like really practical things that allow organizations to see, okay, where do I align, where, where this align with my strategy is not about, it feels a lot like you know, chasing the strategy of others instead of seeing how that is helping the strategy of each organization to actually deliver. 
Uh, it may be that in our case, we can support, I don't know, or do proper follow-ups of three or four of these principles, but not necessarily all. Same with the ROM X indicators or, and you start looking and it's like, okay, which one do I choose? What do I do when I'm doing? And you, all the time you feel you're doing wrong because you're not following everything. So figuring out this, I, I really <coughs> like the fact that you mentioned the principles of digital development, tiny little thing at the end. Having things like that to say, for this principle, these other things are important. Then you start feeling like you are connected and you're contributing and even encouraging people from you know, a bottom-up approach to be able to participate in this process would be really, really good. Um, I'm David Sullivan uh, with the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership. Um, one thing that occurs to me, so principles are invaluable for building consensus, but that process of building consensus, you wind up with a fair amount of passive voice. <laughs> and, uh, and then the concern, of course, becomes that in that passive voice, responsibilities get driven down to implementers and their partners. And uh, I was sort of thinking that you could almost have an accompanying tool for donor agencies to take the principles and then just add like um, specifics <laughs> in terms of who is responsible for each of these things. Uh, going from you know the actors to the events and opportunities and items or whatnot, and that could be particular to each government. And then you could sort of ensure, okay, we're not gonna you know take these responsibilities for human rights due diligence and add that on you know as on top of other things that the implementer has to do that gets pushed down to local partners in the field but that's something that gets built in at the strategy level within the agency with the right people involved um so just a, a thought in terms of how this could be operationalized in a way that you go from that sort of vague consensus to clarity about who does what thanks that's very helpful and i will say the idea for the call for action of donor governments is to allow individual governments to be able to think about within their own internal legal structures and processes and strategies what commitments they might be able to make that are concrete that are kind of bringing the principles down a level to concrete commitments and actions um, and one of the things that we talked about in the drafting process was the potential for building out toolkits as part part of the next year implementation under the Freedom Online Coalition. And so curious if anyone talked about that or has ideas around what kind of toolkit might be helpful. Um, you know, there was a suggestion for different uh, pieces of guidance that was more concrete that speaks to specific tools for different stakeholders, like maybe civil society for advocacy or um, diplomats or development actors uh, who are doing the work out in the field. Um, so any ideas? Did anyone have those kinds of conversations? Online as well, feel free. Zora, is anyone from online um, wanting to participate? Okay. Go ahead, Brett. It's not working. Hello. Hi. Um, Brett Solomon from Access Now. Um, thanks a lot for the principles and, and for the donors um, who have worked on it and for civil society as well. I just wanted to, to your point, and I think also to David's as well, is just... Um, if these principles um, serve as a tool to focus donors' minds on how to get more money out of the out the door and into the hands of the beneficiaries, then I think that's a real plus. If what actually happens is that they become a bureaucratic roadblock to the delivery of money, then that's a backfire. And I think in terms of the toolkits and the processes and the briefings and all of that, like the starting point should be and I'm speaking from the perspective of civil society is, or from my perspective as a civil society member, is that civil society is currently so under-resourced and so under attack and so on the front line, particularly organisations in the global majority. And so whatever we can do to leverage these principles to um, facilitate the transfer of funds from those who have it to those who need it, then the better, and I would think that should be the starting point of any of the briefings or the processes for implementation. It's very helpful, thank you. 
Anyone else want to speak to that? Go ahead, Quinn. I'm sorry, I'm speaking too much, but uh, uh, taking off of what Brett just said, there's something that all of us in civil society, particularly working on digital rights and those these issues are acutely aware of, which is the big hanging question over all of us, particularly in global majority countries of what is gonna happen with open society foundations. Um, there's very strong indications they will be pulling away from funding a large number of the organizations they have supported in the past. And so the question is, what is going to be the response of the donor community if they think it's very important to have these organizations at the local, national level in the global majority countries be strong? What is going to be the response from, as Brett was saying, those who have lots of funding. I mean, statutory donors typically provide larger grants, but it's often harder to get them to smaller ones. And while these donor principles don't necessarily talk about that in terms of that issue, I do think because this is a forum for donors here, DR, I just thought it was useful maybe to reflect that there is a huge amount of uncertainty in the community because Open Society has funded at the human rights level so many organizations broadly and at a small level, but was very useful for sustaining and, and securing. And with that question, there is, a, as Brett was saying, there's a huge amount of uncertainty in the field about how are we going to sustain the momentum that we've had. And so in these donor conversations, it'd be very useful to think about that level of how do we sustain and build the networks that are there when the funding environment is so uncertain at present. That's all. Yeah, that's a really good point, changing landscape for sure. Um, so I wanted to bring it back to the question that Daniela raised about private sector. See, are there any private sector partners who maybe could comment on how private sector organizations who do have even more money than donors do oftentimes um, could potentially partner with donors on digital security or any of the other um, issues raised in other principles. Invite those online or in the room. Michael, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if there are no other private sector partners who um, want to speak, I will because I know you are one. <laughs> Thank you, not appreciated. Um, so I think this your question speaks to a broader challenge, frankly, which is that uh, in low and middle income countries as they undergo digital transformation that expands the cybersecurity threat landscape. And so there absolutely needs to be more effort as some are already doing. For example, the GFCE, the ITU is looking at this as well, among others, Microsoft too, the government of Sweden. How do we mainstream digital security, cybersecurity into the digital development arena? And as we start to now look at the post 2030 agenda, we need to be much more acutely aware of that than when the 2030 agenda was created in the first place, where digital transformation was undervalued as a, as a means for uh, achieving the SDGs. It's kind of a conversation happening now, which is a bit too late. And so how do we think about cybersecurity in the post 2030 agenda is absolutely a critical component of that conversation, which is starting now. The GDC process must be part of that whatever happens with the, the new agenda for peace as well. But uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it's much bigger than just what we're looking at in these principles today, I think. Well, and that raises a, a good point about some of the other fora through which these conversations and particularly the human rights and uh, democracy affirming kind of perspective could join forces with uh, some of the more traditional cybersecurity conversations that have been uh, occurring in the ITU and GFCE, um, et cetera. And so would love to hear if anyone is engaged in those processes currently, if there are any concrete recommendations for next steps for trying to engage in those spaces and networks that have thus far not been uh, connected that well, at least from the space where I sit in the DRG, Democracy, Human Rights and Governance Bureau at USAID. Um, and I know from talking to other donors as well that the, the democracy and human rights issues on the technology side have been um, siloed oftentimes from many of these other technology conversations that are happening at the global level. So any insights from anyone in the room or Michael, feel free to also respond. Or anyone online as well. May I? 
Yes, please. Yes, I don't know where to start. Uh, thank you for being uh, one of the participants in this uh, launch. Uh, but all that I want to say, my name is Honorable Ratila from Botswana. Uh, it's around uh, 3.05 in the morning. Uh, all that I want to say here is the when you are talking about the civil society, indeed, the civil society can play a critical role. But at the same time, we have to um, try to understand some few things because in most of the country, you will realize that there's no a strong, a strong civil society in place. But the um, a digital uh, violate or dig digital human rights violation are in place. So how, how are we going to try to protect those um, people who are living in those countries um, very strong civil social who can try to protect the interests of the ordinary people or the community but uh, at the same time the donors cannot reach that uh, because they have not registered a in the respective country, but at the same time, I'm telling them that no, I will decide because I'm a member of parliament. I keep on telling them no. Once the violation of the human rights take place on the issue of digital, I will take the government to court. But at the same time, I don't have enough financial muscle to uh, protect the interests of the ordinary people before the court of law simply because of the financial muscle. Now I want to pose a question. How are we going to assist those type of the countries that are not really vibrant in the issue, uh, in the line of the civil society? Uh, thank you. So I think if I'm understanding right, the question was in spaces where civil society doesn't have that kind of leverage with the government or doesn't have the resources, um, how it is that we can support them in order to hold governments accountable when human rights are being violated. Um, if, if you wanted to put something in the chat, we couldn't hear some of the audio was breaking up. Um, I think that's an excellent question and I think that's something that donors can heed the call on to support civil society um, and these principles certainly provide a foundation for doing that on these critical human rights issues in particular. Um, so thank you for that. I will right now turn it over to Sydney um, to close out the session uh, and he will introduce the last speaker. Yes, time flies when, when we're having fun. Uh, but, and so we're, we're a bit late, uh, but I'll, I'll introduce maybe uh, um, Adrian Di Giovanni, our team leader uh, uh, on democratic and inclusive governance at IDRC. And uh, he'll be providing some, some closing remarks. And he's online uh, from Ottawa. Adrian, over to you. Hi, good, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. All right, so I'll just dive in, and uh, it's really just to say a few words of thank you. It's it's bedtime here, so I managed to um, join in for the plenary discussion right now, and I can I have a flavor for the richness of your discussion. So really, to our distinguished guests and panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it's a it's an Im immense pleasure for me to join you from Ottawa, Canada. We're on the unceded, unsurrendered territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people, and we just passed our third annual National Truth and Reconciliation Day in Canada. So we always recognize the traditional custodians of the territories we're on. And um, it's a wonderful event, the launching of donor principles on human rights in the digital age. And really, um, we're, we're really delighted to have been part of this effort. And, and the principles couldn't arrive at a more critical time. I don't have to talk to a group of experts like yourself about the you know fast pace and ever acceler uh, accelerating pace of change with technology and and how it can be a, a double-edged sword and, and we always grapple in our work you know do we, do we talk about things as an opportunity or as a challenge and and we, we see it both and especially um, for democratic values and human rights for the most marginalized and um, vulnerable communities in the majority world and you know Digital technologies, yes, powerful tools for information sharing, self-expression and organization, but they can also be used to deny or diminish people's human rights. And, and again, I think within the room, it's probably come up quite a bit, a lot of the threats. And we've seen how digital technologies can play a key role in um, the decline or backsliding of democratic processes. And this, um, Vera, from what I understand, and I, I read her opening remarks, um, mentioned 
um, how most often where you see stresses online um, in the digital space, it, it reflects a broader decline in human rights and freedoms across the world. And, and we see that work, it, we're the Democratic Inclusive Governance Team at IDRC. We see both the online stresses on the ground and actually how they may feed one another. It's something we actively try to think about and understand. And so that's why at um, the International Development Research Center, Center here in Canada, um, we're, we're a funder and a champion of research for sustainable and inclusive development. And, and we've been supporting work to improve evidence and understanding of all these critical phenomena, like information disorder, technolo technology facilitated gender-based violence, um, and the online shrinking of civic space. For more on that, see Rahia in the room there. She's definitely a resident expert. Um, and really for us at IDRC, we focus on the experiences of populations and communities across the global majority. Um, we have also aimed at strengthening the capacity of research institutions and civil society organizations um, to build global South knowledge networks um, and to better enable cross learning and scaling of policy solutions. And so a couple of examples are the Feminist Internet Research Network um, and the Data for Development Network. And so many of the discussions just now definitely ring true about trying to reach local organizations, actors, flowing our funding directly. We, we, we're, we're nimble enough, we often get to do it. And it's really where um, colleagues like Sydney and, and Rahia find great joy in the work. We also see the power. Um, and for us, this is part of our contributions to a localization um, agenda. And on technology, we definitely see the gaps and opportunities, um, especially in terms of ensuring that strategies are tailored to context and even on non-European language, where from what I understand, most of the action can be um, on, when it comes to some of the distortions we see for democratic governance. Um, so just to say collectively as donors, we have a responsibility to ensure that the actions and investments made in digital initiatives do not contribute to an erosion of human rights protections and democratic institutions, processes, and norms. So in other words, to echo the introductory remark, donors must do no harm. And, and that's something, because we're a research funder, we take seriously do no harm across um, every single um, project we fund. And so it's not a pediment to funding, just to echo a comment earlier. It's, it's actually something we, we take very seriously and it's becoming harder to understand how to ensure we do no harm um, with many of the threats out there um, to democracy around the world. Um, and this is why the donor principles are such an important step. They provide both a safeguarding and accountability framework to ensure an alignment between investments and digital in innovative initiatives and commitments to human rights and democratic values. So I'll also emphasize the importance of inputs from government, civil society, and private sector throughout the consultation and drafting process of these principles. I Z, we're, we're kind of a public institution. We're close to civil society. We engage with a variety of actors. And so these kind of multi-stakeholder um, settings we really see um, as key. And I want to thank, take this opportunity to thank all colleagues who have taken the time to provide feedback and, and really to improve the principles and to arrive at the um, version that you see now. Um, and of course, the adoption of the principles is just the start. And that's why together with US colleagues, we have wanted this launch to be not just about presenting and discussing the principles, but already to begin to dive into the critical question of so what, or now what, and what next, um, especially through the breakout groups you've had and, you know, I've had the pleasure to just really hear um, your debriefing now. And so um, this idea, again, it reflects our, our, our mix of what we think is needed for effective change going forward. So as, you, as you've all just done in this session, you've started to address the issues around what the principles actually might mean in practice, what kind of internal and external change is required, how to go about implementation, who do we need to engage with, and how can we measure um, progress once it is made? Um, this is vital, vital into translating the principles into action um, and impact. And I have to say the large majority of the work that we support on human rights is about the implementation gap. You can have many great principles and frameworks and constitutions around the world. It's really then ensuring that they get implementation um, in the spirit, implemented in the spirit of human dignity, um, as was mentioned in the opening remarks. So if you do have further input to provide, we really encourage you to share any comments or suggestions you have after this launch, including through the dedicated email address colleagues from 
the FOC have created. I imagine someone in the room can point you to it, but it's donor principles at freedomonlinecoalition.com. And so let me just conclude by thanking again all of the panelists and the presenters who came before. I um, believe that they have already been thanked. And uh, also really to end on a note of gratitude to our U.S. colleagues who have shown incredible dedication and commitment throughout the development consultation and negotiations of the donor principles. It's a, with a debt of gratitude that I'll end and uh, blame Sydney thank if I've gone over time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you so, thank you so much, Adrian, and thank you to everyone for, for the launch. And thank, thank you very much, you Lisa. Everyone.